The year is 1974, and now I'm 19 years old, and I am the luckiest boy in New York City because I am the assistant engineer to one of the legends of the business, Lifetime Achievement, Grammy Award winning producer engineer, Phil Ramone. Now, unfortunately, Phil passed away a couple of years ago, and so he can't be here tonight, but this would really have been Phil's event. He was the R of A&R. And like Lou Marini said before, we have lost so many incredible musicians and singers over the last several years. So let's just have a moment of silence to honor the incredible folks that we have lost over the last several years. So we're in the big room of a &R, Studio A1, and we are about to start recording what many people consider to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest albums of all time, Bob Dylan's Blood on the Tracks. Yeah. Dylan is standing over in the corner of the control room facing the wall. He's a strange man. And it's my job as the assistant engineer to escort him out into the studio to set him up. And uh, I bring him out to the studio to put him behind the mics. I can't believe that I am inches from Bob Dylan. There he is in his black vest, his Jufro. He's got his guitar around his shoulders, his harmonica holder around his neck. Some of the top studio cats are behind their instruments. It's Eric Weisberg and the Deliverance Band. Eric and Charlie Brown on guitar. Late Richard Crooks on drums. Tony Brown on bass. Tom McFall on keyboards. Now, these guys are usually pretty cool. You know, they play with the best every day. But this is different. This is Dylan. The guys are stoked. The energy in the room is electric. Now, there is no producer or arranger on this record. So the guys are going to come up with what's called head arrangements. Dylan will teach them the songs, the chords, and the structure. And the guys will come up with their own parts. And then maybe after a couple of hours, they'll come up with just the right setting for the song. So Dylan starts playing the first song, and it sounds a little bit like this. If you see her, say hello. She might be in tears. She left here last early spring. Is living there right here. And Dylan plays this song one or two times, and then without saying anything to anybody, he just starts playing a different song. He starts doing this song, You're a Big Girl Now. Our conversation was short and sweet. It nearly swept me off my feet, and I'm back in the rain. Oh, and you are on dry. Now the cats don't expect this. They make mistakes. They play the wrong chords. And as soon as they do, Dylan swats them away like he's getting rid of an annoying gnat. He plays this song once or twice, and then again, without saying anything to the musicians, he just starts playing a third song that sounds something like this. They sat together in the park as the evening sky grew dark, she looked at him and he felt a spark jingle to his back. Was then he felt and wished that he'd gone straight. Watched out for a simple twist of 
again, the musicians screw up. They don't know what, that he's going to be doing that. They, they play the wrong notes and the wrong chords. And again, Dylan just makes them stop playing. Before you know it, all the musicians are sitting silently behind their instruments. The dream that they were going to be playing on a Dylan album becomes the nightmare that they are not going to be playing on the Bob Dylan album. The air goes out of the room like air, the energy goes out of the room like air from a balloon. Now, studio musicians are tough. If Steely Dan wants to take 12 hours to cut a basic track, they never say no, they never flag, and they're better in the 12th hour than they are in the 11th hour. Right? But this is different, man. This is just mean. You can see the disappointment on the musicians' faces. We end up cutting the entire album in a night with just the bass player, Tony Brown, sitting inches from Dylan, watching his hands on the fretboard, trying to figure out what the next chord is that he's going to play. Dylan comes in two more nights and records the album again and again. Now this is really weird because in those days, a guy like Paul Simon could take a year to make an album. And this guy records the album three times in three nights. But the songs, man. This album was presumably about Dylan's breakup with his wife, Sarah. And I don't think there is a song in his repertoire that is as painful, as intense, as sad as the song Idiot Wind. And it sounds something like this. Someone's got it in for me. They're planting stories in the press. Whoever it is, I wish they cut it out quick. When they will, I can only get. They say I shot a man named Gray. Took his wife to Italy. She inherited a million bucks. When she died, it came to me. I can't help it if I'm lucky. People see me all the time. They just can't remember how to act. Their minds are filled with big ideas, images, and distorted facts. Even you, yesterday, you had to ask me where it was at. I couldn't believe after all these years, you didn't know me any better than that. Sweet lady.
take in the studio, everyone is silent for a few seconds. And then Dylan turns to us in the control room and with a sarcastic snarl says, was that sincere enough? <laughs> what? Now, when I was a kid, rock and roll was my religion, and the essence of that religion was the truth. And here's one of the gods in the pantheon, and he's totally full of it? The guy kills his studio musicians with the aplomb of a psychopath? He does his album sloppily in a day and then does it two times more? And now this? Was it sincere enough? Man, disillusion can really mess with a young kid's head. Now I know that the blood on those tracks was Bob Dylan's, but just a little bit of that blood were those studio cats and mine. Thank you. Let's hear it from Mary Lee Cortez, Andy York, and the great Rob Paparossi on harmonica. Thank you so much.